Imagine that your goal, that your mission is to heal the broken. Imagine if your mission is not just to heal the broken, but to save the lost. That why you came, why you decided to to invest, why you decided to do what you did, your goal wasn't wasn't selfish. It wasn't for your own glory. It wasn't for your own good, but it was for the sake of others. You, you, you came because you wanted to, to see people's lives healed and changed and broken. You wanted to see lost people become saved. It's exactly what Jesus did. It's exactly why Jesus came. It was his, his mission. Yet all the while you were misunderstood. All the while you were hated. You were mistreated beyond anything that anyone else ever had to endure. And it's exactly the way Jesus was treated. Not only that, imagine having your best friend betray you, your best friend deny you, that, that to say that he never even knew you, not once, not twice, but three times. Imagine your closest followers, not just your, your best of friends, but your closest of followers, all fled and left and betrayed you. Again, your mission was to help, was to save people, was to to see the the broken healed. And yet you find those closest to you are fleeing and claiming that they, they never knew you. Imagine that those people beyond your closest followers those who were following you, those who who were your disciples, that all of them turned against you. Have you ever experienced anything like this? Have you ever experienced just maybe one person betraying you, one person turning from you, one person being like that, Not, not everyone that was dear and close to you? And imagine that you are completely innocent, right? That everything you're doing is is right and for the good of others. Like you have not wronged anyone. You have not harmed anyone. You have not broken a law. You have not sinned. You have not not talked behind anyone's back. You've, You've done everything to help others. And imagine that everyone knows that. Imagine that your closest followers even know that, but yet they still turn and betray you and flee. Imagine that as you are are being convicted and called guilty of crimes that you did not forget, that instead of Instead of releasing you, instead of, instead of saying, no, this isn't right, they choose to release a criminal, someone who had been convicted, someone who truly had wronged others, someone who, was, who had done terrible things to other people, and yet, and yet they release Barabbas instead of releasing Jesus. And everybody knows it. And you've done nothing wrong. And all of this is coming at you and all your mission was was to help others, to heal broken lives, to see lost people saved. But not only that, because you were wrongly accused, you received a punishment with which you did not deserve. You were ordered to to have your hands bound together 
and, and strapped above your head to a pole. As a, a strong and powerful Roman soldier began to whip you. Not just with a whip, but, but with, with a whip containing leather straps. And at the end of these leather straps were, were tied pieces of, of sharp bones and, and maybe pieces of, of metal. And, and some accounts say that, that there were pieces of, of solid like lead and that they would continually whip and beat you. For doing nothing wrong and for being innocent. Now it was Jewish law that, that you would not receive more than 40 lashes. But remember this was the Romans. And so it was a, a Roman soldier. So they likely did not follow Jewish custom or Jewish law. And so likely there were more than 40 lashes that Jesus endured. Now, I don't know about you, but just straps in and of themselves, but when they are laced with bone, as they would hit Jesus back in his shoulders and his arms and his legs, it just tore his flesh. Once that was finished, a robe was thrown over Jesus' back. The soldiers, those who were in charge of Jesus, mocked him. Spit on him. I can't imagine all that happened to Jesus. For someone that came for good, someone that came to heal, to redeem, to save, that's how Jesus was treated. Not only that, but after enduring all of that, they then strapped, and, and, and some, there, there, is, there, is, there are differing opinions, right? There are some who say that Jesus carried the entire cross from, from that place to, to Golgotha. There are some who would say that it only would have been the cross beam, that because of the weight, that it could have been upwards of 100 pounds, that, that it was just the cross beam that was tied to his, his arms as he started the track from where he was to his final destination. Some 650 yards, some would estimate, that he carried that beam or that cross the entire way after being brutally beaten, after bleeding in, in, in ways in which we probably can't imagine, after, after his beard being torn and ripped from his face, after the, the Roman soldiers uh, creating this crown of thorns that were were jammed upon his head and he makes his way through the streets as those who were gathering were screaming and yelling and spitting and throwing 
can't imagine what it must have been like. But not just that. So then he gets to Golgotha. He gets to his final destination. And he finds himself laying on his back with this cross beam. And a few soldiers grab his arm, hold it down tightly. And although many say that his hands were pierced, It couldn't have been his hands because as he hung from the cross, he would quickly have just, it just would have ripped through his hands. So one Roman soldier would have found the place in his wrist where there, if you feel your wrist, right right in just below your hand, you feel this area, there's a, a, a little indentation. And it was in this place that they would have driven a six to eight inch long spike through his left wrist pounding it deep in into the timber that he had carried and then his right then they take this cross beam if if that's in fact what he carried They affix it then to the the post that would have been stable and already there and prepared. And as he's hanging there, they would have grabbed his legs and his feet, placed them on top of one another and grabbed another one of those spikes driven them through his feet, through his arches and his feet. Now, mind you, when they put his arms and his feet, they didn't stretch him out like this because they knew that that would even cause him to die sooner. So they gave some slack. They gave some space in his arms and in his legs so he could move up and down and in and out so he could breathe because if he was completely stretched out, And if he couldn't at times support himself by his feet, that he would die quickly of suffocation, that he couldn't breathe. So they wanted to make it as painful as possible. And so for the next three hours, Jesus suffered on the cross. At times, supporting himself from his wrists, that was too excruciating he would push up from his feet and then when that pain was too much he would try to arch his back to to catch and grasp a breath Don't forget what he'd already endured. The blood loss, what his back and legs must have looked like, and the splinters 
from the rough timber that they would have used and all that Jesus endured. But not only all of that, but Jesus knew it was all coming. He knew what was awaiting him. And he still did it. But he didn't just do it. He did it for you and he did it for me. Jesus gave up his life. He experienced all that he experienced because of his mission that he came to accomplish. To heal broken lives. To save lost people. You and me. And I find it interesting that God wouldn't call us ever to do anything that Jesus hasn't already modeled. That Jesus has gone through and he, gone, he went through more than what any one us, any one of us could ever imagine. And as God calls us to give and to sacrifice and to carry our cross, he would not do that without Jesus modeling it for us. So if I can finish that passage that I began with, 2 Corinthians 1, 8 and 9 says, in fact, we expected to die. Sorry, let me go back to, to verse 8. We think you ought to know, brothers and sisters, about the trouble we went through in the province of Asia. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure, and we thought we would never live through it. In fact, we expected to die, but as a result, here's what we need to understand. But as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely only on God who raises the dead. Profound. When someone says, God won't give you more than you can handle, you have my permission to say that's hogwash. That's baloney. Whatever word you would like to use, it's hogwash. God does give us more than we can endure. Why does he do that? Why does he allow bad things to happen to good people? So that we would not continue to rely on ourselves, that we would understand that God desires that we put our faith, trust, and assurance in him, that we rely on him. But so often we here in this life, we've got this, right? We can do this on our own. We're strong enough. Right? And all the while, it, it drives a wedge between us and God as we think that we can do it, as we think that we are strong enough and powerful enough. And all the while, God desires that we would rely on Him for everything, in every situation, in every circumstance. We can rely on Him. God, we can trust him, right? We know how the story ends. We know that it didn't end in death, 
we know that it didn't end in that tomb, but that Jesus is alive. And because he's alive, we can trust him. We can rely on him. God loves us too much. He loves us too much to allow us to rely on our own strength. So he gives us more than we can handle. 